Um, if I'm interrogating my basic understanding of, like, a color, where should I start? Damn it, he's gone silent. <sighs> right. Okay, I can't remember if it's color space or color gamut, or if they're both the same thing. My understanding, completely wrong, I'm being very defensive about it, of color space slash gamut, I don't know which term is correct, is that it's the range of colors that are picked up or can be used. If you have a big line, that's the whole spectrum, that line becomes more and more detailed as each slice becomes a different color, like dynamic range for color. Again, this could be a complete complete misinformation. I know that when you're color grading, I think, I don't know if it's to do with highlights and shadows, but if your highlights and your shadows are complementary colors, or if there are complementary colors on the screen, that's generally a go-to, but that's also why people always do orange and teal, which is like a cliche now, apparently. I know that one of the parts of post that the DP is generally involved in is color grading, sometimes editing, but mostly just color grading. I know that there are some colors that when applied to certain textures and certain lighting conditions don't appear very nice on camera. God, this is like a, um, it's like having to deliver a discursive in front of a crowd of 300 people, just like ad lib. Lot of clippable shorts material here. I know. I know that a vector scope exists. I don't know how to read them. I know that curves exist. I kind of know how to read them, but I also don't. It's something that if I were to hear it, I'd be like, oh, right. I can't say it out loud. Let's try a different attack. Why do you care? I don't feel like I know enough about it. It's just such an important part of what's on screen. I don't really know much about it at all. I know that color grading exists. Can't, like I've only really done it like recreationally, very poorly on Premiere by like just pressing some buttons. Like it's, it's, just, it's like a huge gap in my knowledge that is supposed to be really, really important to like that part of the job and just like what ends up on screen, you know? Next project you go into with your current understanding, do you have a workflow in mind and a signal path in mind? No, I do not at the all moment. Right. So first of all, let's just untangle. Did those two terms make sense? Workflow made sense. Signal path is something that I've heard that I've probably forgotten what it means. All right. So we're going to examine a signal path here mm -hmm. where the signal starts is at the sensor before it hits the sensor then there's technically no signal mm -hmm. but we're going to extend that path a little bit more just for the sake of of illustration so we're going to include what's actually going to hit the sensor so what we are going to get a mental picture of is here's the scene here's the subject here's the screen and what the viewer sees right and all that's in between that is the signal path? Yes. At any step in that path, things can happen to alter the colors. And color management is the technical procedure to preserve the intention, the choices made by the creatives from the sensor to the screen. Okay, color management. So this doesn't necessarily mean that what exactly what the sensor saw is exactly what the viewer sees. It's more about preserving the, the intention, like the vision, yeah. what we want. Right. If exactly what the sensor saw ended up with the viewer, it would be pretty gross to look at under mm, most circumstances. No? Yeah. Depends on how technical we want to get at this stage. Right. Okay. I think the, the biggest problem with color management is that the way we record color digitally is technically insufficient for the amount of colors human vision can see. Right. Most of our color modeling, so that's how do we take this big spectrum of colors and shrink them down into a transport method that is workable for current computer resources. Okay. So imagine that our rainbow, every possible color in that visible spectrum had its own label, its own name. And a way of thinking of that is like a watercolor set. You know, you usually get the eight or 10 color patches. Yeah. Rectangular set with like two rows of round discs for the actual paint colors. Yeah. So imagine every single possible color that we can distinguish <laughs> had its own patch. How oh, big man. would that watercolor set need to be? Pretty huge. And I'm assuming that means that there's a lot of information that whatever computer you're using needs to take in. Well, I mean, like, yeah, it just wouldn't fit. It simply wouldn't. Okay. 
<laughs> so does that mean that your watercolor set, your standard, let's call it 12, does that mean that you can only paint 12 colors? Well, no, because you can mix them together. Aha. Uh -huh. So yeah. that's the strategy. We're taking fewer samples out of the spectrum and we're mixing them to create the in-between. That only sounds like it complicates things more. Or does that make things easier? Well, it certainly makes it uh, easier for the bulk of the storage that we need. Mm -hmm. Probably the starting point for understanding this is the tri-stimulus model, which is supposed to mimic the receptors in the human eye. Hence, we got the RGB, uh, the rather right, than carry okay. the trillions of patches we'd need for every single de determinable color within the spectrum, the rainbow, we only we just have three. three. And we can mix those together to make all of those colors. Yes, okay. at least in theory. Right. And do you remember the spectrum, the Roigbiv? What was the name of Roigbiv? I don't remember it by that name, but I've definitely... Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Right. So that means red's on one end of the scale, violet is on the other extreme scale. Right. G then green is somewhere in the middle. So our three primary colors, the ones that we use for the basic tri stimulus model R R G B. Yep. Yep, I see it. Just typed that acronym together to have a look. <laughs> Next to RGB in my notes, I've seen the acronym CMYK, which is another form of mixing, apparently. Is that relevant to what we're talking about at all at the moment? Yes. Okay. But we need to take a detour via saturation. Excellent. Off the top of your head, do you remember what saturation is in color? I can't define it. I know what the little scale does, but I can't put it into words. I think it increases the intensity of each color. Intensity is is a good... good. Excellent. I just ad lib that one. That's it. good. The reason why I need to take a detour there is that the C and Y colors are called complementary or secondary colors. Right. And in some ways, this is more technical than creative. Awesome. Very exciting. So in theory, one of the primaries, let's say, for example, red, if we take an equal amount of its secondary color or complementary color, when they mix together, they cancel each other out and we get no color some shade of gray. Right. So in some ways, the complementaries, the secondaries are a very technical term. Another way of looking at it is, you know, the R, G, and B. Yep. The complementary color is the other two colors mixed together. So for example, so, red's complementary color is yellow. So green no, and blue not. mixed together is yellow. No, it's not. Really? No, it's not. What's red's complementary color? Is it green? Green and blue mixed together in equal amount. Cyan? Cyan, indeed. Right. In the tri-stimulus RGB model, the complementary to any of the primaries is the absence of that primary. Oh, okay. Because if I have R, G, and B in equal amount and I remove red, what am I left with? Green and blue. Yeah. So green's complementary color is purple because it's red and blue mixed together. Well, magenta, technitically purple. Magenta, is, uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Mm, it's a neat little trick. And the complementary color to blue. So we've had C and we had we have had M. Yellow. Mm -hmm. yes. Getting my color theory right. Another way of kind of defining our complementaries, our primaries and secondaries are visually. Mm -hmm. If we take our rainbow and we wrap it around the clock. We get the color wheel. Are you familiar with that color wheel? Yeah, I love the color yeah. wheel. It looks pretty. Mm -hmm. Another way of thinking of complementaries is colors, hues, vectors that are 180 degrees apart on the color wheel. Oh, okay. So, you know, you look at this, cor this corner of the color wheel up here. And you just go, and yeah. the complementary colors down there? Yeah. Okay. Because when you think about it, if you think of cyan as the absence of red if you say red is here on the color wheel and cyan in here uh, there's gotcha. no way you can have both the dog agrees as usual mm -hmm. i'm happy that yeah. it does This leads us to another use of the three channel method of recording color information. So rather than mixing RGB or describing using those three channels to describe the varying amounts of three different colors, we can use one channel to record hue information on the color wheel. So we take the 360 degrees and divide them up into as many bit values as we have available in whatever codec or format we are recording it in. 
listen to. Mm -hmm. We take saturation, i.e. color intensity, as the second channel. Again, taking 100% to 0%, dividing that up into whatever bit, bit depth we have available for that channel. And then the third one is lightness. So, you know, like we can have the same color, but if it's lighter or brighter, it appears different, right? Right, yeah. So we've separated each of those channels, as in red, green, and blue, into their own saturation hue and lightness no we have replaced channels replaced replace them with it mm -hmm. okay this is gonna be one of those discussions i think this is gonna be one of those long pause i'll just let you continue and then see if it clicks because i can see that something doesn't quite compute let's call it a different language okay it's a different language okay so we've got mm -hmm. one language records color with r g and b and mm -hmm. just mixes them together to get whatever information was on whatever this second language has a hue saturation and lightness way yes. of reading the information instead of rgb yes okay that makes sense now i'm I'm, I'm all clear. We can describe exactly the same color in both systems, but would come out with the wildly different numbers in the three channels. Ah, right. Okay. Because one number in the RGB channel refers to a specific. All right. Let's see if we can make uh, a simple example. Okay. Go. So let's say that for argument's sakes, we are going to describe primary red. Yeah. In our RGB tri stimulus, our red channel would be 100%. Our green channel would be 0%. 0%. And the blue and channel, blue would, be channel 0 would be 0%. So for I am... argument's sakes, again, Ooh, okay. let's say that we're going to describe primary red in HSL. Okay. And let's say for argument's sakes that we are placing red at 12 o'clock on the color wheel and we are calling 12 o'clock on the color wheel zero mm -hmm. just to add on to that example so if i want to describe cyan in the rgb language right then i'd be doing zero percent red 50 percent blue blue 50 percent green nope you do 100% green 100% blue okay okay and is the color wheel only applicable to the hue saturation lightness example like that language or is it just like a mental image being used to make this easy to understand bit of both so in our color wheel coordinates we were saying that we have put red at 12 o'clock and we're calling 12 o'clock zero out of 360 degrees right yeah in this example then because we want to place the actual hue smack bang on red our first channel would read the value zero yeah our second channel would read primary red, nothing else. That would be full saturation, so 100. Mm -hmm. And then depending on whether we are looking at different versions of the HSL, so there's HSL, HSV, and HSB, and they record saturation differently. So let's say just for argument's sakes, we want middle of the road brightness. So we're going to set the L, the third channel, to 50. So can you see how like we're talking about the exactly the same color, but different ways of notating that color has given yeah. us completely different numbers, right? And it's going to be a, it's going to appear to be a different color now. Like if no, we're no, 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 the, the, no, 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 no. This is the point. Okay. All right. We have taken the exact same color, but because we're using two different color models, the numbers we use to describe that color are completely different. Right. So in our um, first example, we've been using an RGB tri-stimulus model. We have ended up with 100, 100 zero, 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 zero. In our second okay. example, we're taking exactly the same color, but we're now describing it as zero, zero, 150. Okay. All right. And these two languages, do they exist separate of one another? Is it you use one or another? Uh, in camera, it's generally RGB, mm -hmm. uh, but we see HSL more in post. Okay. We also see it now coming into, for a while, into LED, the RGB color fixtures. Right. Some fixtures, you can either set pure RGB values or you can use an HSL color wheel. Oof. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm beginning to, you just, you do the wheel and then you do your saturation and your brightness and... Yeah. Okay. So in terms of... I'm, I actually, can see it in my head. In terms of creating a color, it's probably more intuitive to use the HSL model. Oh, okay. Because you, you see it on the color wheel, right? Yeah. Whereas RGB, you kind of have to mash a few numbers together to see what you're actually going to get. Yes, exactly. Okay. So we've covered all this, all this stuff. We've got our, we've got our tri-stimulus input slash color processing i don't really know how to put it sounds to me that rgb is generally the one that happens the one that's used in camera that is 
recording color by a certain value attached to the colors R, G, and B. When those values are mixed, they create new colors and so on. HSL is the alteration of like one color on the color wheel through saturation, hue, and lightness. Those three sets of numbers that would otherwise look quite similar mean something completely different. When you use the HSL model to change your colors in post under the hood, the app will translate to RGB values. Yeah. Because to display it on your computer, which has an RGB it will need to know pixel display, yeah. How hard should I drive the red channel? How hard should I drive the green channel? How hard should I drive the blue channel? Right. We are already seeing that the way we name colors, so to speak, can change depending on the color mm -hmm. model that we use. And we've kind of skirted the issue of bit depth. And by that, I mean, how many numbers do we have available to describe the values in each channel? So for sake of ease, we've gone with zero to 100. Mm -hmm. And we saw already there, translating between RGB and HSL, we ran into a problem with the hue. How so? Because well, hue just had, had 360 possible values. Right, because it's on the because color it's wheel. 360 degrees, right? Yeah. So we had to make a translation there to fit it into our 100 possible, well, 101 possible numbers. So the way that I picture the color wheel is that it's bright, dense colors around the circumference. And as it goes further in, it turns to white, like it lightens up a little bit. So I'm assuming that hue refers to the circumference. Yeah. And then so as, you can... as you fiddle with lightness and saturation, then you begin to move inwards and in different directions. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So okay. If you, it, Excellent. If, if you think about it, if it makes it easier, think of, of the hue as a clock. Mm -hmm. So different colors are at a different hour. Yeah. So can you see how already we've got a translation problem because 360 and 100 don't really fit. No. All right. So let's say we uh, increase the number of possible values in our RGB model. Let's say we go from 0 to 100, we go to 0 to 255. All right. So let's say in our 0 to 100, we have got 56, 56, 56. Mm -hmm. How do we fit that into our 200? zero to 255 scale. Can you see, again, we've got a translation problem. We've got a rounding problem, right? Yeah. At least in theory, it's easy to going from a smaller scale to a bigger scale. Yeah. Because in the bigger scale, we've got more in between values, right? Yeah. But problem is when we go from a bigger scale to a smaller scale, then some of those in between values are going to become imprecise because we just don't have enough numbers to fit it. Mm -hmm. So the... I guess the, the big takeaway of color management is how do we make sure that the camera, uh, the color that the camera saw is the color that the display shows. And part of that problem then is how do we describe the colors? How do we translate values from one system of describing color to another along the signal path? Yeah, which is sounds like a thing that a human being can't really do independently. So generally what we're looking at doing, we were just saying going from a bigger scale of describing color to a smaller scale is easier. Mm -hmm. Generally, this means that we want to capture color with more values available to us than what we want to display. Yeah. And we also then want to manipulate colors in even more values than what we captured. Okay. So we're moving first from camera to display because obviously this is what you look at. No, right. we have looked at the extremes of the signal chain, the signal path. Okay. Start and finish. Okay, so display is in finish, like final product. That's what we see. Okay. Oof. Okay, what's in between all that then? What's the... And that's where we... Where the fun begins. This is where the fun begins. All of what we just did is a preamble, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. <laughs> in terms of color depth, the possible colors that we can give a number, a unique number, should be bigger in our camera than what we need to display. Okay. When we want to manipulate colors, we want to do that in an even bigger number scale than the 
camera captured. How is that possible? You only have what the camera captured. Because you can remap it so you get more in-between values for when you want to move things around. Okay. So the way I think of it, you, are you familiar with the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yes. I think of this as the Maslow's hierarchy of color. Ooh, we can make a nice little graphic out of this, I think. Mm -hmm. So you know how Maslow's uh, hierarchy is a pyramid? A pyramid? Yeah. So the Maslow's hierarchy of colors is an inverted Ooh, okay. pyramid at the bottom is the display that needs the least colors above that is the camera needs more colors and above that is post and that needs even more color okay all right as we add numbers to each color channel it means we can mix more in between colors like we were just looking at going from 100 numbers per red green and blue to 255 colors per red green and blue we can describe more color values right mm -hmm. and there are two ways we can make use of that increased description range we can either make more fine increments in between colors or we can expand the whole range right so one way of making use of this let's say we go from the 100 to 256 values that we just did if we want to use that increased number range for more precision more in between shades we would take 100 and divide by 250 five etc 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 and map like the zero and the full value to exactly the same colors by using 255 numbers to describe those would get more steps in between mm -hmm. yeah so we get more precision in our color description yeah or we could take here's our zero to 100 scale we can go to this volume of total color we can keep the same step change in between each color and go to 255 and we get a wider range of color so there's a there's an option to slot more detailed small changes into the pre-existing range so you mm -hmm. still start and end at the same point but there yep. are more steps in between or you can increase the range so you end with mm -hmm. a different color or a different yep. version of that color. Okay. Yep. Now, th this is purely theoretical. In practice, what we do is increase both. Mm -hmm. No, it's increase both? Yeah. So as we get more numbers available to us, we both increase the precision and the total range. Okay. I am following. I promise. I'm yep. just, it's, you know, I just need to, the, the, the brain's churning away like a hydroelectric plant. Do you know another word for a range? That's a great question. You have used that word today. You don't say. I do say. Funny how I can use words so easily, except for when I'm asked to use them. What's the dictionary definition of the word gamut? Range? Oh... Right. Okay. So we're talking about color gamut right now. Defines the range of colors. So that we've been can secretly be talking about color gamut the whole time. Like, mm -hmm. as a big twist. We've been you've been secretly teaching me how color gamut works. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a great way to. That's a great way to go about it. By the way, that's excellent. Don't tell me what I'm learning until I've figured it out. Until you've learned it. <laughs> I guarantee you, if you'd been like, okay, here's how color gamut works, mm -hmm. there, there would have been some mental block in the way where I would have been like, but what does but what does the gamut have to do with this? Learning all of that backwards was quite nice, actually. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure about this because I'm not a, a motion picture or video engineer. I'm not a color scientist. So yeah. this is my layman's understanding. So do keep that in mind. My understanding is that the difference between a color gamut and a color space is that a color space is something that is agreed on industry-wide. Mm -hmm. And color gamut is a range that is specific to a camera, a manufacturer, a post-production software. So color space is something that's kind of like a universal... Yeah, a color space is kind of like a very strictly defined color gamut. Mm -hmm. If the definition of the specific numbers, what colors do the specific numbers mean, is agreed upon industry-wide, then it's a color space. Okay. If the system, the specific numbers for a particular color isn't generally universally agreed upon, then it's a gamut. So different pieces of software will have different color gamuts. So the number ascribed to a specific color or a shade or something on Premiere Pro is different than that on DaVinci Resolve because they have different color gamuts. Is that what you mean? More about cameras than the okay. production software. Cameras. Do some um, AI voice stuff and replace that with two different kinds of cameras. Then, uh, you know, what I, so, so that way, what I just said was actually correct. So do you remember the settings we wanted for our file formats in the red? Bear with me. Just look at the big Bible. Um, red menu setup. Do you remember talking about IPP2? Yes, I do. In the I color pipeline? 
So do yes. you remember the specific settings that made up IPP2? Menu settings display, look video, IPP2, image processing pipeline 2, a uniform standard for capturing the entire color, the entire range of color in an image. It is recommended you Here, almost range, always gamut, range gamut yeah. range gamut and it is recommended you almost always use red wide gamut RGB color space red wide gamut gamut use gamut. log three G ten okay. gamma space so we don't need the gamut That's what I yeah okay so that means that that particular coordinate system of colors is only applicable to red right okay so. It's a gamut, it's not a space, because other manufacturers will take the same color put in front of the camera and give it a slightly different number. Right. And why do they do this? Is it just a quirk of, is it like a one of the many things that cameras, you like camera companies use to differentiate their products? Or is it just like a, a consequence of like making products independently of one another? I think it, it's a little bit of both, but think right. of the inverted, the Maslow's hierarchy of color. Mm -hmm. So your camera wants to be able to record more color than we displayed. Yeah. Now exactly how much is not a standard. Yes. Okay. I'm all I'm here. Just take me a while to process things a little bit longer than usual. For example, to, just to give you some made up uh, examples, mm -hmm. there is no standard saying that for X given display color space, your camera should be able to capture 25% more color. Right. That depends on the camera. That's not the standard. Yes, correct. Okay. So if one typically... manufacturer can capture 26% more color and one manufacturer can capture 22% more color, they'd need to use the numbers available to them to name a color differently. Yes, because the range is different. So the Okay. Exactly. Right. The gamut is different. Because in an ideal world, we want to have our camera able to capture more color than we're going to display. And we want our post environment to work with more colors than we can capture. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a translation process because the numbers for the exact same color is going to be different in the camera. It's going to be different in your post-production software. It's going to be different in the final file. And is this where codecs come into play? Uh... Yeah and no. Awesome. All right, let's Love keep a good yes and no. Let's keep codex separate. Okay. Let's just deal with color for now. Okay. So the color management process is making sure that we are translating from one naming system to another correctly. Mm -hmm. And it's also a set of rules for how do we deal with values that don't precisely translate. Yes, I'm following. So for proper color management, you need to know, A, what is the color space of the destination? Mm -hmm. The color space, not the gamut? Because it's a display, it's universally de defined. Okay, yep, yep. And that's usually where we find our universal definitions is in the display because everything ends up on similar displays, right? Yeah. We need to know the color gamut of the camera. We need to translate that into the post-production software. And from there, we need to translate those numbers into the display color space. Okay, so you've got gamut, you've got to know the color gamut of the camera. You translate that into your post-production software, which has its own way of reading color. So if they have to translate that successfully, and then because the color space of your display, whatever display is being used for the final image, is different because it's locked to something universal. You need to translate it to that as well correctly. So there's a lot of changing numbers, but making sure Indeed. they're also... And so what we want to make sure is that along the way, we don't mistranslate because we were going from another coordinate system than we actually were coming from. Yeah, okay. So when we do color management in post, for example, we need to define three things. Mm -hmm. What's the color gamut of the camera, i.e. what's the input? We need to define the gamut that we want to be working in in post-production. And then we need to define the color space of the display, i.e. the output. Okay. So in most color management procedures in post-production, you will get literally those drop-down menu options. What's your input? What's your working space? What's your output? Oof. Well, now I know what to do when I get those drop-downs. That's good. They won't be nonsense to me. Now, this does mean that you want to be able to find out your camera, what is this 
color gamut. Mm-hmm. So I'm just thinking now about the fact that I need to figure out the color gamut of the black magic before I shoot on it, before to getting my hands on that. Now, it is technically possible to shoot in the same color space as you're going to display. But that would be silly, wouldn't it? You would lose so much range. Yes, indeed. Yeah, okay. So a lot of the color management process comes when we want to make use of that range. Like right now, because... I'm taking the color off the camera and sending it straight to Zoom. I'm not doing anything in between. Mm. Going out and it's coming back from Zoom to me in the color space of the display, which for YouTube is Rec 709. Classic. So that's the HD color space. Right. One of the reasons I recommend working post at least the color finishing in uh, and color management in Resolve is that as far as I know, I haven't really touched Premiere in quite a few years, but Premiere, at least traditionally, has been pretty poor at color management. You don't have a lot of options. It kind of does all these translations for you, trying to be helpful but doesn't tell you what it's doing. Right. And the Adobe family of products, bit of a color wise, is a bit of a dysfunctional uh, family, at least traditionally has been. They don't really share the same language, do they? One of the reasons why I moved away was you take the same raw file and put it into Photoshop and Premiere and RF effects, it looks visibly different. Yeah, because for some reason, they all just translate color differently. Yes. Mm. And the other thing that I'm not entirely sure of is the, the working gamut inside Premiere for dealing with color. I'm not sure how wide that gamut is. Mm-hmm. I do know that DaVinci's new wide gamut intermediate color space, gamut RGB, whatever, they, they've got a wide gamut color space for working with, is wider than any of the different find color spaces. That was the kind of introduction as opposed to the technical part. That was the preamble again before we get to the real complicated stuff. You know, all of that was very easy information, very easy to absorb, very accessible. So I think part of this process for me is about like working backwards. Mm -hmm. Start with finding and defining your delivery, your display color space. Okay. So for me, in my circumstances, it would probably be Rec 709. Mm -hmm. So I think Okay, for shooting, generally you don't want to see what you're shooting in it's like kind of washed out. Sorry, it's so it's so hard. That once you start talking about raw, I need to be so careful my terminology because like I can't say looking at like in raw because you can't look at raw. But like the I remember when we shot the short our shorts, we had the option to choose Rec 709 for the display to get a better idea of what it would look like once it had been like just kind of a slightly more display accurate image of what we were shooting. But we were shooting in raw, which obviously we can't see. Is that normal? Choosing like yeah. a... I thought Rec. 709 was a, was a LUT. Like I thought it was a LUT that we were using to view our footage while we were shooting it to make it more comprehens- like more comprehensible to us. That's one way of achieving that is by so using a... a LUT, translating from whatever camera recorded. Okay, so in that context, it was a LUT. No. I thought, I thought we used a LUT called Rec. 709, but alas. I love finding out that I didn't actually know what I was doing after the fact now you're uh, doing things to the <laughs> same effect but a lot is a very specific thing yeah okay so our let's tow it to design yeah right so i think at the, the current stage what we really want to hammer home with uh, color management is start with your display your destination you want to find out the exact specifications of that color space. And now we are also going to go into gamma. Awesome. Because Rec. 709 has been around since the transition from CRT to LCD to OLED, mm-hmm. some of the specifications have changed. So gamma is a transfer function. A transfer function. So the very technical sounding version of a gamma corrected video file is an EOTF, an electro optical transfer function. Mm -hmm. And this is a legacy from CRT monitors because their increase in brightness was not perceptually linear. So to compensate for that, the input values into the monitor were given a different graph function to compensate for the non-linearity in the increase in brightness of the actual tube technology. Okay. And everything since has inherited that. I think I'm following. Mm -hmm. The function is between input and output values. So if you imagine a graph Mm -hmm. with input values on the horizontal axis 
and output values on the vertical axis. If we have a one-to-one -one relationship between input and output, then the graph that connects them is going to be exactly 45 degrees. But but it's nonlinear, so it's and this something is, else. This is also like it's a... why, particularly in post-production, we need to be extremely careful about how we use the term linear. So uh, mathematically linear is called linear light. Linear light, like yes, uh, L-I-T-E? No, L-I-G-H-T. -L -I okay. As in the light output is linear. Right, okay. Signal with an electric optical transfer function is a signal that is compensating for the non-linear behavior of the old CRT tube technology. Needs a bump in the middle to make it perceptually linear. So there's a difference between mathematically linear and perceptually linear. Correct. Hence the electro-optical. How does it look as opposed to how does it measure? Right. The head's so hurting. <laughs> when you check your display color space, you also want to check the exact gamma number. So the gamma number shows how much of a bump are we giving that curve in the middle. Okay. So the most commonly used gamma figures that we see are 2.2, 2.4, and 2.6. So when you check your display's color space, you also need to check, are we using 2.2, 2.4, 2.6 gamma? Okay. Yep, I just had to absorb all of that, collate it in my head. So part of the process of seeing what your display... So the biggest differences in appearance between 2.2, 2.4, and 2.6 is the image brightness and the contrast. Right, okay. Which is what I generally think of when I think gamma. When we go back to the camera and, and the color gamut of the camera, we also want to be able to capture as much dynamic range, i.e. brightness values, as possible. And again, we want more dynamic range than our final display. Mm -hmm. Is it the same order as the pyramid where you want, the like, this display has the least dynamic range, then camera, then pose? Or is Correct. It camera. Yeah. Okay. All right. Same thing. Now, in terms of dynamic range, the dog agrees. We are also limited then by we don't have enough numbers to fully describe possible dynamic range of human vision. Just invent more numbers. What are those mathematicians up to these days? Same as with the tri-stimulus model of color, we can get some more efficiency out of our numbering system for dynamic range because of the power law function of exposure or brightness changes. So if we just double the amount of pixel values, if we increase exposure by one stop, as we saw with your dimmer example, we're going to run out of numbers very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So we can use those numbers more efficiently rather than going with a straight line in the transfer function between input and output. If we do an inverse log curve, mm -hmm. we can record more stop values for the same available numbers. Think about it. Again, if we go back to our 100 value scale and we say we're only dealing with black and white, let's leave colors aside for the moment. Mm -hmm. If we start at a value of one and we want to go one stop brighter, we go to two. Mm -hmm. We want to go another stop brighter, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. We can cover about seven and a bit stops of dynamic range, which is nothing. Yeah, then suddenly 100 is a lot smaller than it sounds. Yeah. So can you see at the lowest stop, there's a difference between one, between two stops. Mm -hmm. But at the highest stop, there was a difference between 32. Yeah. We went from 32 to 64. Yes. So it's like it's, it's non-linear again. Like it's a... So I think by I'm applying the inverse log curve, so a log curve would go up, wouldn't it, right? Yeah. So if we so invert by... that, it goes up, but then it flattens. Great, great, great clippable material here. Uh... Sure, right now. Do you mean like a plateau where it's like... And then like so back down, it goes or... up fast, mm -hmm. and then it flattens. I'm gonna Google inverse log curve for a second. Oh, okay. Now I know what you mean. Now I know what you mean. Now. It goes up regular... quite sharply, and then it yes. curves, and then it flattens. The regular old log curve, but on its side <laughs> rather than right up. up. On its side. Okay. I was picturing. Well, I was picturing something completely different. So like, it's, it's, it's a mix. I'm not now. sure whether right. I, I may have tripped you up. I'm not sure whether inverse is the correct term. No, it seems right to me. But the point yeah. being, by <laughs> translating from input to in 
output via that logic curve, we get a more constant value change for each stop of brightness. So we use the numbers more efficiently. Mm -hmm. <sighs> However, the flip side is that it really flattens out our contrast. So for example, Ari are claiming now with the Alexa 3517 stops of dynamic range, I think. If we take 17 stops and want to cram them into a display that is designed for seven and a half stops, eight stops, the contrast is so low that it just really looks washed out. Huh. I'm going to pretend that makes sense to me. Well, if you think about it, if you take that range in your display and we record this range... Oh. It's oh. going to have to squish and flatten to fit into. Right. I see what you're saying now. So basically, we've got a line that's going, it's, when it's recording, because of the, the high dynamic range, it's going. But when you have to cram it into a different range, it actually goes. And then like flattens and stops. And that makes the contrast worse. No. See, now I'm just doing to you what you've done to me. <laughs> This is all right. So let's just for a moment say that the end result of the log curve is to linearize the values. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you know we were saying at the the lower end, the first few bits, we're going plus one for the first stop. We're going plus two for the second stop. Right. But for the last stop, we could fit into the display. We went 32 for that last stop. Mm -hmm. So rather than saying that difference of one down here is a difference of one stop and a difference of 32 up here is a one stop, can you see how that difference, the rate of change is nonlinear? Yeah. Right. The log curve, for example, this is actual figures, but just to make it easier to comprehend, allows us to say that each stop of increase in the camera captures means uh, increase of 10 in cold values. Yes. So whether it's the last recordable stop or the first recordable stop, we've linearized those numbers in terms of yeah. rate of change, right? Yeah. So okay. instead of being our sort of like one and then our 32, it's just a bunch of... Yeah. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Yeah. Okay. Right. So once we've got that set up for us, we are back to a straight curve, right? Yeah. So if we have a wider range that we've recorded... Let's say we can record from here to here. If we're going to fit that into the same scale for our display, that curve will by necessity flatten. Hence, oh. we get lower contrast. So you know yes. in your dark okay. table, if your yep. curves are flatter, you get less contrast. Because we've taken all this range and squashed it down here, the curve has flattened. So we've got like a big, you know, the square, the... The frame that surrounds me right now is a big graph and mm -hmm. we've linearized our stop increases and the camera has recorded that. However, suddenly the display can only, only pick up that. this much. Yeah. And in order to fit that, or in order to fit all of the stop increases while also not exceeding the bounds of what can be recorded, it needs to essentially make the change less steep and make it like Flat that, out. which means that there's less difference between the brightest points and the darkest points of the image and therefore less contrast. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and that's an issue. So it sounds to me like the more you exceed, and in the, I know this is a high, this is a dynamic range example, but we could probably apply it to it apply it to color gamut the more you exceed the gamut the or next the, hang on can i just comprehend it first for a second Did I okay try to... all right yeah let's just do it with the dynamic range thing then the more you exceed the dynamic range of what can be displayed in your camera that the more you risk damaging your contrast in the final image is that right no 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 <laughs> it just means that god damn it <laughs> it just it just means that what the camera sees in terms isn't viewable without some sort of translation into the display gamma oh okay so we're, talk we're talking about this is all prior to translation this is all just issues that come without the translation hence why you need that a way of viewing something akin to rec 709 yeah so, so if, what's you the next? Put a, if you put a log recording straight into Rec 709, well, technically BT 80, 80, 80, 1886 gamma, then it's going to look flat. Mm -hmm. What's the next big mind blower thing that you mentioned? Well, dynamic range equals gamut. Oh man, that's like that's like that's like hearing a spoiler that your favorite character on a TV show dies before you watch the episode. My <laughs> comprehension. What a, 
died. What a heart crushing! What a uh, heart crushing thing to hear. <laughs> R.I.P. Comprehension. Uh, because when you think about it, by increasing dynamic range, you increase the dynamic range in red. You increase the dynamic range in green,、mm -hmm. and you increase the dynamic range in blue. Because as you have more、and、brightness, you get and... more color gamut. Yeah, because you have you have more、Values. more brightness and more darkness, which、yep. ascribes to color because color is affected、mm -hmm. by shade. So you get more color because you get more <sighs> dynamic range in each of red, green, and blue. You automatically get more. Color gamut.、Uh, cool. Actually, that makes sense. I'm not, I'm not too bothered by that. That makes a fair bit of sense. I like that. It almost makes things easier. I hope. Careful, careful. <laughs> Here be dragons, colored dragons. Oh man. The exact shape of that curve. Oh right. Duh. Sorry. Hang on. Sorry to interrupt. Duh. Because whenever I hear high dynamic range, whenever I'm talking, watching a TV or like a 4K disc, the big draw on the, the consumer level, high dynamic range for displayed、it's、images, colors, is color. It's color. I had that not occur to me. I'm always thinking of brightness values, and you know the brightness is very important as well. Whenever you have HDR, watching whatever movie you might be compelled to watch in 4K HDR, hypothetically a space opera set in the far future with a lot of bright colors and you know that kind of thing. You know you get. Man, okay, it's all coming together now. So I don't know why I never made the connection. Whenever I think about dynamic range, when I'm thinking about, I, I guess another way of looking at it, by necessity, if you want a wider color gamut, you need more dynamic range. Yeah, I'm a bit baffled at myself at never having drawn these connections because I have my cinematographer brain and my consumer brain. So when I'm consumer braining, I'm watching stuff. My consumer brain comprehends HDR as a、Technical. cool range of color. Technicolor, great color.、Mm. My cinematographer brain literally hears something different when it hears HDR. When it's active, clipping and it crushing, goes, clipping and crushing. And I never thought, oh yeah, more that color. That sounds like like a, a fancy new haircut. Clipping and crushing. I need a haircut. I'll ask my hairdresser for a clipping and crushing. I'll get a clip and a crush, and I'll see what it, see what it shows up as next episode. <laughs> Do you feel on more solid ground, or do you feel like things have gotten more complicated? I'm in a more, I'm in the kind of between the two area where I have a bit of comprehension. Frankly, I'm a little bit stressed out as well because now I know that I need to talk to my editor and be like, "Hey, have you punched in the correct gamut for like what we shot it in? And then have you punched in the correct gamut for our Rec 709 final deliverable and all that?" But I'm sure we can do that in the finishing room at some point. Like this is. Kind of reminded me that there's so much more to think about. I recommend work backwards. So you do you check the boxes in the same order. Yeah, this is one of the episodes that I'm going to have to come back to and take detailed notes on once it actually releases, just as a me exercise. Because I have a few episodes like like sensor size crap factor as well as kind of an episode that I need to return to and like take notes on, put in my bible. Here is the rundown of what we what we discussed so far. <sighs> Started with the tri-stimulus languages or language、uh, languages. I'll just yeah whatever. RGB versus HSL. You can also think of them as coordinate systems. Kind of why we refer to them as space. Right, a bit like X Y Z. Yeah. RGB versus HSL. So we have our RGB prescribes values to the colors red, green, and blue. However, those values red, green, and blue would be the three stimuli. So RGB ascribes a number value to red, green, and blue. Those numbers determine how much of those colors we see and how they mix, generating other colors. However, to make things more confusing, HSL also functions with three numbers. So I think it's because we started with a system with three columns. When people wanted to find different ways of describing color that was more usable to them, they go, "Okay, I've got three columns. How can I split what I see into three columns?" Yeah, RGB is generally the recorded format、mm -hmm. in the camera, whereas HSL, which is hue, saturation, and lightness, is the more intuitive graphical way of messing with color, and it refers to the hue. Which in the color circle is the full color along the circumference and moves around the circle as you set saturation and brightness and lightness. I get the impression it refers pretty much to the hue value happens in 360. That brings us onto our translation issues because how do you translate RGB, which is sometimes 100, 100, 100, for example, to something that reads as 360, 100, 100? How do we make sure that the color the camera saw is the color the display shows? That's when we get the translation. So part of the translation as well comes with bit depth. Mm -hmm. Because computers store information in binary, when we increase the bit depth, we can describe more possible 
color values. Generally, you see the wider gamuts having greater bit depth. Mm -hmm. The most common bit depth values are 8-bit, 10-bit, 12-bit, 14-bit, 16-bit, and 32 bits. So 8 bits gives us 256 possible values per channel. Mm -hmm. Hence, I used the example 0 to 255 because 0 is considered a value out of the 256. Yeah. 10 bits gives us 1,024 values per channel. So 0 to 10. 10, 23. 12 bit gives us 4,096. 14 bits gives us 16,384. 16 bits gives us 65,536. And then the big jump, 32 bit, 4.2 billion something values <laughs> Jesus. per channel. Man made horrors beyond my comprehension. That's ridiculous. Uh -huh. So the possible gamut of a 32 bit color space or color gamut is 4.2 billion times 4.2 billion times 4.2 billion. Which is, is that, is, that a, is that in the trillions or like what's the... I got, no, I don't it's, know. it's incomprehensible to us. We mm. will never actually truly understand the gamut. To know is to is to be sent insane. So currently we are sitting at like uh, UHD displays generally are 8-bit, which means that raw capable cameras are anywhere between 12 and 16 bits. And the wide gamut uh post production working spaces are working in 32 bits so can you see that maslow's hierarchy of the pyramid of color gamuts of color yeah how do you feel colored after this i feel like i have learnt things and like i know that like if i don't take notes on this maybe a week from now i'll probably forget a fair, a fair chunk of it but like right now i feel pretty good um there's still some things i don't completely understand but i think it would still be pretty good Okay, so we talked about tri stimulus RGB. Uh, the way that those numbers look similar, RGB and HSL, but actually mean completely different things. HSL, oh. HSL. Those power tools. You can hear them. Yeah, but funny thing, they gave me major flashback vibes to dial-up modem. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a great clippable moment right there. Um, right, try stimulus. Try stimulus. HSL and RGB have very similar looking formats with three numbers. However, completely different meanings which means that you have to figure out translation. How do, and then that's when we kind of get into our pyramid or our like hierarchy of color. We need to make sure all of these things match, but we also need to make sure we know that we've got the order of priority correct. So like- I would probably change my language. Mm -hmm. Okay. So rather than thinking of the display being the least, think of camera and post being more than whatever right. the okay. deliverable is. So instead of setting a low expectation for the display, Set a high expectation for camera and post. Or higher than the display. <sighs> but work backwards. Figure out your final color space first, your display. Normally Rec 709 in my circumstances, like YouTube or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then we get into gamma. I've written how much of a bump. And we have certain settings to make sure that the bump is the same. Or at least translatable or the equivalent. This is when we kind of had our big conversation about logarithms and those curves it took me a while to understand how it worked and then it ended with hdr meaning color as well as brightness and darkness and that for some reason blew my mind because the the neurons in my brain that were the consumer side and the creator side weren't attached at any point you know just the different consciousnesses just weren't mixing together additively or subtractively uh <laughs> Anyway, then we talked about bits, which just sounds hor like horribly incomprehensible. Like just I, like it makes sense, but just the, the incredible numbers that you reach. It's, yeah, and that's this. It's been a big day. <laughs> what will a color space that exceeds human perception even look like? Is there even a point? It's kind of like why have a camera that can record more than you can display? Why work in post with more than what the camera can record? Right. It's been a it's been a big discussion today. Color me defeated. Color me not defeated. Color me just exhausted. Color me Frodo and Sam, you know, lying on Mount Doom while it's falling apart and just being like, I'm happy to die now. I'm alright with that now.
that's okay. Come at me like that, you know? Did you get anything actionable from today? My major takeaway is knowing what HSL and RGB are, knowing how HSL works. Actually, the best takeaway of today is, is our hierarchy of color. And also just like, you know, making sure I know my display's color space, then the gamut of my, however I'm working in post, then the gamut of the camera, and then also the order of tackling that, like making sure that I have greater range in post than I do the camera and a greater range in the camera than I do my display. Those are things that I, that's, that, that's all new to me, but makes sense. It's all new, but it makes sense. And that's what I think is great information. <laughs> I think the other one that I'd like to try and hammer home as well is that that kind of compatibility process of making sure that your camera gamut and dynamic range and gamma is compatible with your post dynamic range and yep. gamut, all of that being compatible with your display, color space, and ga gamma, all of that collectively, end to end, is color management. Okay. So we just covered color management. Well, we probably haven't covered it, but like, just kind of cool. Great. Excellent. I will need to come back to this one and take notes. <laughs> Decompress. Like a lecture. Decompress. I'll have to go from 8-bit to 16-bit. Um... Now we got some birds. <laughs>